Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Wendy Teo from Singapore and I think they put me first up because I win the travel award for um, traveling the furthest here. It was a 14 hour flight from Singapore and then uh, three and a half hours on the train from Zurich apparently, but it turned out to be a five hour journey because there were rocks on the train tracks, etc. So anyway, it's my first ski conference. I'm very excited to be here. I know you guys are all going heli skiing. I'll just be with the Swiss school instructors learning how to ski and lecturing in a miniskirt just to be different from you guys. Okay? <laughs> Today I'll be talking to you about video laryngoscopy, different strokes for different folks. And I just want to give you some background. First, I thank my industry sponsors and partners who have made it uh, possible for me to conduct research and education in the Asian Pacific region where I've championed video laryngoscopy. That's a little map of the world. That's where you see Singapore, so 14-hour flight to Zurich Airport and onward to here. I come from a very different place, small city island, country. Lots of people, 5.5 million people, very dense, can't walk down the street without bumping into someone, and very hot. There was a heat wave in Singapore, 35 degrees centigrade before I came in, and now they tell me it's minus 22 up on the Matterhorn with like minus 50 kilometer speed winds, so this is a different ball game for me altogether. This is what my country cityscape looks like, okay? Big urban jungle, very different from the beautiful slopes that I'm seeing here. Now, I used to work in this hospital um, from 2000 to 2014, and I bring you greetings from this hospital. Let me tell you what's special about this place. Now, in recent years, we've had natural catastrophes. You've heard about tsunamis, earthquakes, and all these natural disasters and everything, partly due to global warming, etc. But have you ever heard of a birthquake? Because in my hospital, 39,000 babies were born in one year in 1966. And this was not a fluke, okay? We did this year after year after year for 10 years in a row, and that got us into the Guinness Book of World Records in 1975, okay? So if you think you're having a busy call, one delivery every 13 minutes. So thank God we didn't have an epidural service then, because that's my forte. <laughs> But now the Singapore government is lamenting about dwindling fertility rates, etc. So we only do about 12,000 deliveries there, and that accounts for 30% of the nation's babies. I went to private practice in 2014, and now I zip around in my car and go to like seven different hospitals in a day providing epidural service, doing caesarean sections, etc. I anesthetize about 1,500 patients a year on top of a busy conferencing schedule. So you don't see many pregnant people on the slopes here in Zermatt, I understand. So I'll just run through a few things here with you. Before I left, I did an audit, eight-year audit in my hospital. 28,000 caesarean sections, and our general anesthesia caesarean section rate is actually 11%, and this is considered high for an academic obstetric center, because the ones in the UK are looking at 6% GA rate, USA only less than 1%. And this has got severe repercussions for the trainees coming up in anesthesia who might have gone through the entire residency training program without having intubated a parturian or a pregnant lady. Now in Singapore, just look at the red line. That's the private hospital rates for caesarean sections. This slide's really like 20 to 40 years old. Fast forward to this day, in a more litigious society with rising medical legal costs, etc., the caesarean section rate is even much higher now, approaching almost 50%. And in Singapore, we have this thing called horoscopic seizures, where pe people want their babies born at a certain time, you know, like they like multiples of eight. So for example, like 8th of August 2018 is going to be predicted to be a busy day and stuff like that. And they want their babies out at 818 or something like that. So we get a lot of requests like this. <clears throat> I was instrumental in uh, uh, putting up the uh, failed obstetric intubation algorithm in my hospital before I left. Here, it really was in conjunction with the uh, ASA difficult guidelines as well, now proposing that video laryngoscopy should be used if you suspect a difficult airway. And here we talked about the two optimal laryngoscopy attempts, because the first chance, first attempt is always your best chance, okay? So apart from the usual things like having a working suction, putting the patient in the hit rem, sniffing air position, pre-oxygenating, and uh, using a smaller size tracheal tube because there's a lot of edema in the pregnant lady, we advocated using a video laryngoscope, and we chose the uh, Macintosh type blades because these ones are intuitive to people who d in, don't intubate regularly. You know, 90% of our cesarean sections are being done by a spine or a combined spinal epidural. So that was instrumental. So on this background, I'm going to share with you a few things today about different strokes for different folks, and you'll see why I've named the lecture as such. Anesthetists come in different sizes, and so do the video laryngoscope blades and techniques, okay? And we have different 
patient populations, all right? We've got different folks. What about the ASA1 patient coming for elective surgery on a Monday? What about the pregnant parturian? And what about if you have a ICU patient? Sorry. An ICU patient with lots of tubes? Do I point here? Sorry. Just went forward. Yeah, here we are. What, do you have, what if you have an ICU patient and not much space there with a lot of edema or re-intubation risk, etc.? So which blades, okay? So different strokes for different folks. We're going to run through today how the video laryngoscopes differ from direct laryngoscopy, how they should be classified, and basically I've divided them into three groups, okay? I'm going to show you some practical tips of use for the three groups, how you document, show you the evidence in the literature for each different groups, and teach you how to predict when you can and cannot use a video laryngoscope and some take-home messages. Now, we know that if you intubate someone looking with a direct line with a Macintosh laryngoscope, you need to align three axes, all right? The oral, pharyngeal, and tracheal axes to be able to view the glottic opening. But with a video laryngoscope, you don't need to, and this is how it works. By putting a camera at the distal third of the blade, Okay, you are able to now look around the curvature of the tongue and bypass the mechanical challenge of creating this direct line of sight. Okay, so you're no longer blind. Now, this is me in a mannequin. If you look directly into the patient's mouth, your viewing angle is only 15 degrees. But by using a video laryngoscope, this widens up the viewing angle to 80 degrees, depending on the uh, position of the camera. So this same principle of look around the corner applies for these different video laryngoscopes depending on where the, the camera is placed. So where do we fit into our anesthesiologist's armamentarium? In the past, you had conventional direct laryngoscopes like the Macintosh and the old McCoy, the articulating tip. The video laryngoscopes can be divided into three groups, okay? The Macintosh blade type as such, the anterior angulated blades, and the channeled ones where there's a conduit that directs the tracheal tube to the glottic opening without you having to use a stylet or a bougie. Then you have the optical and video stylets and the flexible scopes. As I said, in the 2013 reiteration of the ASA Difficult Airway Algorithm Guidelines, one of the biggest changes was this trust for video laryngoscopy. Where now they promote and advocate video-assisted laryngoscopy as the initial approach to intubation. In my part of the world, in the Asia Pacific region, these were the commonest video laryngoscopes used. I'm not sure which ones you all have in Switzerland, probably all. So I got together with a couple of my uh, Australian colleagues who are all video laryngoscopists enthusiasts, and we distilled the information down to three slides for the general um, anesthesia population. And this is how you use them. If you have Macintosh-like video laryngoscopes, the insertion technique should be into the floor of the mouth, used like a conventional Macintosh blade. This displaces the tongue anteriorly and flattens the submandibular tissues. If you have the angulated video laryngoscopes, then you need a stylet, okay? And you need to insert the blade in the midline. When you have a channeled video laryngoscope, no stylet is needed, and you use it with an inbuilt tube guide that allows you to advance the tracheal tube. Now, how do you document when using video laryngoscopy? Because some people say it's not the same as looking directly into a patient's mouth. I want to introduce you to these two concepts. One is the POGO score. I think Rich Levitan was involved in this paper back in 1999. Percentage of glottic opening. We tend to use that a lot in airway research, where basically if you see that's a 100% POGO score if you view the anterior commissure anteriorly and posteriorly the interarytenoid notch. But if you don't, then it can go down to 73%, 24%, who's to say what it is? Now, there's another scoring system called the Intubation Difficulty Scale, all right? Um, it's by Artnet. Basically, they look at the number of attempts, the number of operators, alternate techniques, the COMAC grade, lifting force needed, laryngeal pressure, vocal cord mobility. Zero is easy, zero to four is moderate, mm, slight difficulty. Anything more than five to seven is getting more difficult, and it can go up to infinity, all right? And we tend to use this when we do our airway research to compare different equipments and everything. But on an everyday basis, me talking to you, passing on the case from the helicopter, for example, to the ER room or to ICU, we want to keep it simple. So, me and the Australians wrote this um, 
uh, little letter here to say we just want to keep it simple, stupid, because we just want to facilitate easy communication across the disciplines. So whatever view you get in your video laryngoscope, you just annotate it with a V, and you state the device that's used, because ultimately everyone will still use a grade 1, a 2A, a 2B, a 3, because that's universally uh, uh, spoken language. Okay? Now, are they effective? Takashi Asa is an uh, editor with the BJA, the Japanese anesthesiologist, and in one of his editorials he wrote that in the era of evidence-based medicine, the efficacy and safety of each video laryngoscope should be compared with the conventional direct laryngoscope, uh, with the other video laryngoscopes, and with the other types of intubation devices. So, who knows this guy? Yeah? That's an old picture. When he was caught with the divine, yeah. Then there's a newish picture. Apparently, he's got five kids now. Anyway, for those of you who know, this is an old picture, four weddings and a funeral, Hugh Grant, all right? So I just use this as an analogy to show you. One, one anesthetist, four laryngoscopes, comparing four different methods in 400 patients. So here I have the direct Macintosh laryngoscope. You compare it with a Macintosh type and laryngoscope, an angulated scope, and a channeled scope. Here we used a Pentax. And what did we find? In 400 patients, basically in normal airways, video laryngoscopy versus direct laryngoscopy, you will get improved laryngeal views if the patient has normal airway anatomy. Okay, the naysayers in the crowd going, why use a video laryngoscope in normal patients with normal airways? That's because if you do a meta-analysis of 50,000 over patients, a difficult intubation Comac and Lehane grade th more than three is 5.8% incidence. But the incidence of minor intubation difficulties could be as high as 37% with a spectrum of progressively more difficult ones. So we know that video laryngoscopy gives you improved glottic views, but sometimes the insertion and the withdrawal, the insertion and advancement of the tracheal tube may be difficult. So you need to gain device-specific proficiency for each device first, and you should practice in normal airways first. So that's why VL for everyday routine use would be a paradigm shift that I advocate. Okay? I'll just talk about the three different groups and give you some practical tips. How do you prepare your equipment? If you have a monitor, it should be placed somewhere where your assistant is allowed access to view it, so they'll be able to give you some targeted help with external laryngeal pressure or passing your equipment or giving you that suction catheter. We often know that you get a good view, but then you can't intubate. So these are some of the practical user tips. With the Macintosh type video laryngoscopes, this is intuitive. People know what to do. You can sweep the tongue aside. You can see the curvature of the blade. It's the same as the Macintosh direct laryngoscope. So that's intuitive. People know how to lift, decrease the force, put some external laryngeal pressure if needed. Now, what about you when you have angulated video laryngoscopes? First-time users might not know this, but you definitely need to have a stylet to be able to intubate successfully, okay? Typically bent 60 degrees in J-shape, and you should insert the blade in the midline and adopt the mouth-to-screen, mouth-to-screen technique, and I'll explain why. Ideally, the tip of the blade should be in the vollecular, and then you're able to lift, okay? Insert the blade in the midline. If you don't see an epiglottis in view, you should draw back and apply upward pressure, okay? Now, remember that a beautiful view of the cords is not the best technique for video laryngoscopy, all right? Two problems that people frequently encounter. The vocal cords might be anterior to the tracheal tube tip. And then the second problem is that you can't railroad the tracheal tube over and off the stylet. So what you need to do then is you decrease the lifting force at the handle, Accept that a great 2A view is fine. Maybe apply some external laryngeal pressure, and then you'll be able to meet together. It's a dynamic process, okay? When you're unable to visualize the larynx, sometimes people get very fixated on the monitor. Your blade might be too shallow or too deep, or you might have actually slipped off the side already. So you should take it out, withdraw, and reinsert the blade in the midline. If you can't advance the tracheal tube, you should relax your lifting force because you're hyperangulating on this anterior curvature. You can also do a twist action maneuver. And there's this other technique called reverse loading, where you insert the tracheal, uh, sorry, insert the stylet in the opposite direction of the natural curvature of the tracheal tube, such that when you then advance the tracheal tube and take out the stylet, it tends to swan neck and dive in. Okay, so these are some little tricks that you can um, do. Now, mouth screen, mouth screen technique. First thing you do, you look in the mouth, insert the blade. All right. Then you look at the monitor to optimize the view. Then you should look at the mouth again when you're inserting the tracheal tube and keep it close to the leading edge of the blade. And then you look at the screen again. 
to advance the tracheal tube. Now, why is this important? That's because, for example, with some of the hyperangulated hyper blades like the Glidescope, there's a blind spot there and you actually don't see the tip of the tracheal tube coming into the screen. And this is a danger because you can have a lot of injuries on that right side where the blind spot is. And here you can see the tracheal tube is actually piercing through the soft palate of this patient. Okay? Let's look at the literature. When these people compared the rates of injury after the introduction of video laryngoscopy in their institution, they found four injuries out of 1,700 patients. They looked at their historical data out of direct laryngoscopy out of 14,000 patients, and the rates of injury were less. They then looked at the literature, okay? And you can see that, I mean, the Glidescope's been around the longest, so that's why you have a lot of injuries reported about it. And you notice that it's all on the right side. I'm sorry, the words are a bit small, but everything there from one to three, right, 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 right. So beware of that blind spot in that corner, okay? So adopt the mouth screen, mouth screen technique. Now, the other video laryngoscopes, like for example, the McGrath Series 5, also has the same anterior angulation. So you can run into the same problems. And indeed, other perforations have been reported with these other devices as well that assume the same angle. So important for you to do the mouth screen, mouth screen technique. More perforations in the literature, how do we overcome them? My anesthetic nurses, they like to cut the tracheal tube so that it's not so long and hanging off the patient during surgery. Sometimes when you put the stylet in, it tends to protrude beyond the shortened tracheal tube, and this can cause palatopharyngeal injuries as well if you are not uh, careful. So you should look into the mouth when inserting the tracheal tube and keep it close to the blade edge. Another thing is that a lot of departments sometimes buy the video laryngoscopes and put it in the corner, locked up. This is for when you have a difficult airway. But suddenly you have a trauma patient, teeth, cervical collar, blood, mucus everywhere, and then they bring out the video laryngoscope for the first time, and this is not an optimal time to then try it, because then you have a lot of injuries and you know, not knowing how to use it optimally. When you use channeled video laryngoscopes, you technically don't need a stylet or a bougie. So when I compare the channeled with the anterior angulated blades in normal patients, one of the things that comes across is the technique is totally different. All right? The channeled blades, they are not intuitive. I'm talking about the Pentex airway scope, the air track, for example. Here you insert, you rotate, you elevate, lift up the epiglottis, and then you intubate the patient. So it's not intuitive. With the Pentex airway scope in particular, you have to align the tracheal tube with the green target signal to successfully intubate. Also, you have to be aware that sometimes devices look the same, but they don't perform the same. So for example, if you look at the distal aperture of the air track here, the mouth opening is larger than the Pentex, and so the tracheal tube, as it exits this distal aperture, actually drops down lower. You can see this in the picture here. So the implications is that if you have shoved the air track too deep into the patient, then you risk intubating your esophagus if you're not looking properly. So you might have to pull it up a little bit more to adjust. People say we don't have obesity in Singapore, but this is a series of patients of mine, so we do have obesity as well. And um, one of the problems is that if you have someone with a short neck and big breasts, you're not going to have enough space to insert your video laryngoscope. So how do we avoid this? To start off with, you should ramp, hit ramp your obese patients with pillows and shoulders, uh, with blankets such that your external auditory meatus is aligned with the sternal notch, and this gives you some space. You can get your assistant to push down on the breast as well to create more space. You can scissor the mouth open. You can rotate the blade and insert the video laryngoscope blade from the side, all right? And there's another technique called the pilder-on technique by the Japanese, where basically you insert the blade without the display first, and then insert it. So here you see, this is a mannequin, big breast and everything. There's no space to put the blade in and the, the whole device. So what they've done is actually just inserted the blade first and then you attach the monitor. And that can circumvent this problem of a lack of space here. Now, some of the channel video laryngoscopes only come in one size, so beware those with trismus, small mouth opening, etc., severe retronathia, and also the space limitation. Also, there's a setup time, so if you're in a, a paramedic situation, helicopter, bumpy, and everything, and you have to like open the bag, zip it up, connect stuff, so that's startup time you have to remember, but you need some time for that as well. The King Vision has come onto the market, and that's wonderful optics for a very uh, good price. If you're using the older model, hold the, um, the hold it below the purple gasket because if you hold it higher up, when you tend to manipulate the airway, there tends to be an in, 
advertent disconnection. And when you need it most, the, the screen just goes and disappears. So beware of that. They've come out with these A-blades now. They have the disposable uh, channel ones as well as the standard A-blades. That's reduced the price of the blades by a third. Uh, it comes with the anti-fog mechanism, but just beware the mouth opening of the patient as well. So the benefits of the channel video laryngoscopes, there's a channel guide. You don't have to use a stylet, so purportedly less injury. The disadvantages is that one size doesn't fit all. So if you are in an ambulance service, you need to have a few blade sizes for the pediatrics up to the adult sizes. And if you have uh, these conditions, retronathia, burns, fibrosis, not a normal curvature, then it's going to be a problem. So different strokes for different folks. There's some new kids on the blog. I just want to introduce you to the Vivid, uh, Vivid Track. Have you heard of that? It's a plug and play single use device. You can plug it to your ultrasound machine. I think maybe even now you can plug it to your phone and then you can get a viewing uh, screen apparently. The UE Scope, this is a company in China that is made a whole spectrum of uh, scopes. You even see them at the Euro Anesthesia Congress and the ASA meetings. And the Total Track Video Laryngoscope uh, ventilation monitor. So video laryngeal mask. This one's interesting because it allows you to, like it, it's insertion of a laryngeal mask and you can ventilate the patient. You put on the, the scope, the monitor, and you can view the whole intubation process as well. So it allows you continuous visualization. Now I just want to run through the evidence for video laryngoscopy. Okay, I'll summarize it. People with normal airways, whom you don't predict to be difficult, the answer is that direct laryngoscopy is actually faster than video laryngoscopy even though you get a superior view with video laryngoscopy. Now, that was in normal airways. What about difficult airways? A Cochrane review has come up about this, about uh, direct laryngoscopy for adults requiring tracheal intubation. They looked at 64 studies, okay? And these were the video laryngoscopes that were used. Of the 64 studies, they had some elective ones, some emergency ones, some anticipated difficult airways, and 15 simulated difficult airways. So in the anticipa anticipated difficult airway, they found fewer failed intubations with the video laryngoscopes. In airways without predictors of difficulty, there was actually no difference between direct laryngoscopy and video laryngoscopy. They found less airway trauma with video laryngoscopes. The view of the glottis is better with video laryngoscopy. So the summary is that it improves the glottic view, it reduces the number of difficult failed intubations, may reduce airway trauma, but there was no evidence for improving the number of intubation attempts, the success at first attempt, or the time for intubation. Another thing to note about Cochrane studies is that they look at many, many studies. So they actually looked at 3,000 over studies. That's a huge loss of information. Only 64 studies were included in analysis. So that's important to know in the background as well. That means some data has been lost. Now, another uh, systematic review meta-analysis came out here. This looked at nine studies up until 1st January 2017, so rather current. And the summary of this paper was that video laryngoscopy in the hands of experience in ETSIS, gives you first attempt intubation success that's greater, you get a better view of the glottis and less mucosal trauma. These are experienced practitioners. Sometimes it fails. What are the predictors of, say, for example, glidescope failure? And this paper found that if the patient has altered neck anatomy with the presence of a surgical scar, radiation changes, or mass, or if they have decreased thyromental distance and a decreased cervical range of motion, then you are more prone to fail. So they had 60 failed intubations there. How do you rescue them? You go back to direct laryngoscopy and flexible fiber optic intubation in this situation. This one, another systematic review and analysis. Let's just look at expert intubators versus uh, non-expert intubators in difficult intubations versus easy intubations. So you can see the view, if the patient has got, if it's expected to be a difficult intubation, then the view is greater with video laryngoscopes. This is what this slide shows. When you have expert intubators versus non-expert intubators, let's look at the time for intubation. So in novices, video laryngoscopy is faster than direct laryngoscopy. What about in difficult airways? This is a Swiss trial, 720 patients, um, multi-center, simulated difficult airway, cervical collar, small mouth opening. These are the blades they use. These, these were all airway experts, anesthesiologists. It was a randomized study. Everyone did 10 intubations with each device first before collecting data. They use the anterior angulated blades, the CMACD blade, the Glidescope, and the Graph, and then the devices with the guiding channel were as such. And you can see that the rates for intubation success actually vary quite differently, differently even in expert intubators. The 
kind of problems they found with the unchanneled devices was pretty much the same as the channel devices. So they had problems advancing the tube or uh, viewing problems in those percentages in the two subgroups of patients. This study did not study difficult airways caused by other factors such as obesity and those that had no pathology. So it's possible that the performance of the video laryngoscopes actually differ depending on the type of difficult airway you're encountering so that there might not be one single perfect video laryngoscope for all the patient populations, but instead video laryngoscopes that are ideal for specific airway situations. So just briefly look at special settings and patient categories. Relevant to you, trauma, cervical spine protection, makes it safer to intubate, but makes it more restricted airspace. The video laryngoscopes actually may or may not reduce the C-spine motion, okay, compared with direct laryngoscopy, but the improvement of the laryngeal view tends to translate into higher intubation success rates. And actually, in terms of reducing the C-spine motion, the flexible fiberscopes actually result in the least cervical motion. What if you have patients with huge abscesses and reduced mouth opening? then video laryngoscopes work better and faster compared to a direct laryngoscope. You can see the success rates as such. Now, when you compare in the emergency department, the Macintosh blades versus the angulated ones, the more difficult airway predictors the patient has, then the angulated VLs perform relatively better. Okay. Now, this study is interesting. Trauma patients, non-expert intubators. The video laryngoscope resulted in longer intubation times, okay, in those. And the ones with severe head injury, the glidescope actually took longer, and they found a higher mortality for these patients in this study. So that was interesting. What about if you're up here, like what you guys do? High altitude glacier. You have sun reflection, the snow and the glare. Which video laryngoscope is going to work best? So this group from Bern looked at the Macintosh direct laryngoscope and said that, okay, the hypothesis was that it would perform less well than the video laryngoscopes. They had 20 physicians intubating mannequins indoors in their hospital at altitude with sunglasses, without sunglasses, and on the glacier itself with the mannequin and physician covered with a blanket. This actually occurred in Jungfrau, just close by to here. These are the blades and the video laryngoscope blades they used, and they looked at the first attempt intubation success rate as well as those secondary outcomes. And they found that the best intubation success rates actually occurred indoors. So maybe you should be bringing your patients indoors if you can, or on the glacier under a blanket. Okay? Under direct sunlight and everything, the Macintosh performs best. There were significant differences. Sometimes sunglasses helped, sometimes it didn't. And the screen quality's visibility really differed significantly between the conditions and the devices. So in summary, they say if you have bright sunlight, Successful intubation with video laryngoscopes is less. Maybe you should use a Macintosh uh, because it performs better. And if you really have to intubate on a glacier, put a blanket over your, you and the patient so that it overcomes the detrimental effects of sunlight during intubation. I'll just go forward for this and just come to the summary because we're running out of time. In this l Ganzuri risk index, basically the higher score you have, then you should use awake fiber optic intubation. Okay, this study by Sebastian Russo and his group, I've taken the liberty of putting it in English, and these are some of the conclusions that Michael and I had in an editorial. Basically, depending on the grade of the uh, l Ganzuri index score, there's a spectrum. So if the patient has less predictors of uh, difficult intubation, then you can use a direct laryngoscope or Macintosh-type blade. If a four to six, then you use more the angulated ones if you have a higher predictor of difficulty, all right? And if you have indeed reduced mouth opening or glottic and supraglottic pathology with difficult mouth ventilation, then you should use an awake fiber optic scope. So in summary, an alternative to direct laryngoscopy should always be available. It's not the solution to all airway problems. Your patient has got no predictors of difficulty, then use a direct laryngoscope or a Macintosh type one. If you have a few predictors, you can use a, ideally a Macintosh-shaped one or a channeled video laryngoscope in first attempt. If you've got more predictors than an angulated video laryngoscope, and um, if novices must intubate, then a video laryngoscope will work better compared to a direct laryngoscope. These are trauma, cervical spine, and video laryngoscope. ICU, first attempt, use a Macintosh blade. Backup is an angulated video laryngoscope. Emergency department and dental abscesses as what we've been through before. But there'll be some patients that you can't use a video laryngoscope on, so I put up these pictures to remind you that if your patients have these uh, profile or pictures, then you might have to go back to a flexible fiber optic scope. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you for your kind attention.